you want not to miss about this is for the males okay this is for the males so there are two pieces of cloth now each person that goes for this pilgrimage have to wear or has to wear these two pieces of cloth one is like a cloth of sheet which is tied around here uh, just over the shoulders and the other one is like a wrapping around the legs so when when I wore this that's not the time when I was like you know each each step was bringing me closer to realize that I'm actually going so when I was at Heathrow Airport and everybody's wearing them and I was confused thinking how do I wear this now although I had studied everything but because until practically someone does not do something they'll never get the things I had studied everything and I knew all the fiqhi aspect of everything about Hajj inside out but until I practically didn't do it myself I was unaware so I had, I had to you know, find out, ask how do I wear this, how do I wear it and then they would show me that this is how you wear it and this is what you, what you do and this is how you tie it up so this was at Heathrow Airport and then from there we went to, um, uh, we went to uh, Jiddah and praying two, two raka'at salah, which is two, uh, uh, offering two, uh, um, two, two raka'at of prayers. Um, and we pr offer two prayers, two raka'at of salah, and after that we uh, started the niyyah. Well, the niyyah is the intention, the intention to go for hajj. So for every particular action that we do, there is an intention. And so we did the intention from uh, Heathrow Airport. Um, in fact, while we were on the uh, flight, we had to pass certain things which is known as the miqat. The miqat are the boundaries of where you put the ihram on. So that's where I put the ihram on. Now, the first thing that struck me when I got to Jidda was the amount of people that were there. There were millions of people just there at Jeddah, only hundreds of thousands of people. And I was taken aback because I had never ever seen that many people in my life. And there was so many, you know, because you go to the airports usually and you have loads of people, but when you go to Jeddah, there's millions of people. And so I was sitting there in the queue and the first lesson that I learned was patience and sabr. That's the first lesson that you learn. Because there are millions of people waiting to be, you know, their passports to be stamped. And, and if those people who have gone there before, they will, be, they will know that the Saudi officials, mashallah, they will be a bit like me, you know, how they have their cup of tea, <laughs> one sip, one stamp, and then, you know, then another sip, and then another stamp. And can you imagine how, how frustrating it would be for those people who are there already? And they're so eager to get to Makkah, and yet there's, there's, these people are sitting there and they're waiting, you know, stamping your passport. So the first thing that I learned was patience. And that made me realize that, you know, one of the greatest journeys in our life uh, is the journey from childhood right up until death. And patience is, the, is one of the most virtuous things that a person can learn. You know, we Brits, when I say we Brits, I'm British, so Brits are very, very um, good at queuing up. So they've already got that, you know, the potential <laughs> of patience. Very good at queuing everything. They need a queue for everything. Every, uh, you know, you can, everything under the sun you can imagine. We love queues. That's our, our uh, Britishness. We love queues. So Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me a brick, so I was very accustomed to queues, but I was very patient because I wasn't accustomed to millions of people there and waiting to, for their passports to be stamped. So Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah that I had the patience to sit there and wait. And it's very hot down there. It's a very hot country. And um, we can well imagine the, the amount of, uh, you know, the, uh, the amount of uh, suffering that people used to go through when there were no air conditioning, when there was no such modes of transport that we use today. And the suffering that people used to take, to, to, to go through, and the difficulty that they used to face. Um, 
in the old times, 1400 years ago approximately, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he and his companions used to undertake this journey, um, it was such an amazing time to think that, you know, people used to travel on horseback, on camelback, and people traveling on foot and going from Medina to Mecca. We can't travel from, you know, probably town to here, I can't anyway. So, you know, it's so hard, especially in the scorching heat in the Arabian desert. And the heat is such that, you know, if you, you can't even put your feet down onto the sand because it's so hot. You know, people who are not accustomed to it, they're very, very hot, the, the country. And uh, that's where you learn, you know, patience and sabr, what we call it. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, that وَتَزَوَّدُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, make sure you take your provisions with you. Your provisions, meaning your food and drink and whatever you are <coughs> to take with you for a journey. Make sure you take those with you. وَتَزَوَّدُوا and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says another thing as well. He says, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى وَاتَّقُونِ يَعْمِ الْأَلْبَابِ And indeed, the most, uh, the best provision that anyone can have is that of righteousness. So be righteous. وَاتَّقُونَ And fear me, meaning fear Allah. وَاتَّقُونِ يَعْمِ الْأَلْبَابِ O you who have intellect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the people of intellect to fear him. Fear him in what? One would ask. Because there's millions of people. But why Allah is why is Allah telling us to fear him at that time? So this came to my head that imagine all these people and there was bound to be pushing and shoving, you know. People scolding at each other, screaming at each other, swearing at one another, because why? Because everyone's frustrated, and we know that when a person is frustrated, this is usually what tends to happen, when people become frustrated after a long journey. And then you will understand that people's minds don't, start, don't function properly. At that time, Allah is telling you, fear Him, don't cause difficulty, to anyone else. Be patient and don't cause difficulty and don't make it difficult for anyone else. Forgo your own rights for the rights of others. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us at that time. So Allah says in the Quran, Al Hajj Ashhur Ma'lumat. Now this Hajj it takes place in a certain in a certain month, which is the twelfth month, uh, which is known as the Qa'ira, the twelfth month of the Islamic calendar, which is the lunar calendar. And it takes place from the 8th, 9th, uh, the 9th of the Hijjah up until the 13th. Now, even the 8th day of the Hijjah uh, is known as Yawm Tarwiyah. Yawm Tarwiyah means the day of resting. Yawm Tarwiyah means the day of Resting, and then it's the Yom Al Arafa, which is the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Ninth of Dhul Hijjah is the day uh, uh, of uh, Arafa, which is Arafat is a plain, a field, or a plain, where uh, Muslims from all around the globe gather on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, and they are all clad in the same attire which is two sheets and the ladies are in their uh, hijab and the clothing that they wear but these two sheets that the males wear symbolize that Islam is an equal religion it treats everyone equally why? because in those two sheets you will find a multi-billionaire on one side and you will find a pauper and a beggar on the other side and they will all be standing in one line in one queue so Islam teaches equality at that time and why is it two sheets of paper why is it two uh, sheets of cloth and not three does anybody know 
Why is it only two and not three? Why are we only allowed to wear two? Save money. Sorry? No. Save money? Because <laughs> <laughs> when you die, you only bring two sheets of cloth? Almost. When a baby is born, you know when a baby is born and everybody's happy and the child is born and what's the first thing that the nurses do when they take the child and present it to the mother? Before they present it to the mother, what do they do first? What's the first thing that they do? They wrap the child into one cloth. So the journey has now begun of life. And then they go into Hajj for the pilgrimage. They wear two sheets of cloth. Another journey. So this Hajj, two cloths, is reminding us that you're, an in, you're in a life which is in between from the mother's womb to the Akhirah, which is the hereafter, in the grave. So there's two... Uh, times and eras and between those that's where you are right now at the pilgrimage there's two sheets of cloth represent that and then when a person passes away they're wrapped, it, wrapped up in three sheets the males are and the females are in five so three sheets of cloth when a person is buried. So this is this journey. Allah is telling us and showing us that, look, you came from somewhere. When you came, you didn't know anything. I gave you one sheet of cloth. Now you had two sheets of cloth at the time of pilgrimage when you went there. And when you die, you are in three sheets. So it's stages. Allah is showing us stages of human life. That's why you have two, and not three. Anyway, about the equality aspect, when there is millions of people, and they're all wearing the same clothes, no one is going to look at someone to say, oh, wow, you're wearing Gucci, and Dolce, and Gabbana. Huh? <laughs> you're not wearing that. Nobody's wearing that over there. Everybody's wearing the same two sheets of cloth. Huh? Nobody's going to be wearing any other food, clothes or anything and <coughs> look at the other person, tattered and torn clothes. I'm better than this person. No fashion, this, uh, you know, uh, no fashion aspect over there. Everybody's in the same clothes. And everyone started from when we went to Makkah now. So, Let's talk a bit about the Makkah. Makkah, when we got to Makkah, when we got to Makkah, um, as we were approaching Makkah, you could feel the difference in the atmosphere, and you could feel that you're coming to a much more spiritual place than where you were. And as soon as you approach there, it's, it's amazing because we went straight to, first of all, we went to um, the place where we were staying. And the reason why we went there was because we had to leave our baggage. So we went to leave our baggage and from there we went to, we took a shuttle to the Haram. And the Haram is the place where the boundaries are, where the, where the people perform the, the tawaf, the uh, circling of the uh, house of Allah, which is the Kaaba. When we approached there, subhanAllah, you know, it was just an amazing, amazing feeling. Never, ever, have you ever got that feeling in my, in, in, you know, in, I've never had that feeling in my life. As soon as you see the Kaaba, the Kaaba is what the name is like a cube. It's a building which was built many times. And this Kaaba first was built by the Malaika, which is the angels. A bit of a brief history about the Kaaba. This Kaaba was first built by the angels, the Malaika. And they built it on the exact same plan as the Baytul Ma'mur, 
What is the Beitul Ma'mur? The Beitul Ma'mur is that place 